welcome again to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and I'd like to thank you for joining me today for another discussion of military history. Today we're going to return to Spain and examine the military revolt that broke out there in July 1936. This would be the beginning of the terrible three-year civil war which would devastate the country and claim the lives of hundreds of thousands of Spaniards. Some of the issues alluded to in this episode will be ones that I discussed in more detail in a previous episode from a couple weeks ago, dealing with the state of Spain and its army in 1936. I'd like to refer any listeners who may be curious about the historical background to the breakdown of the Spanish state and the relationship of the army to the political life of the country to this previous episode. As for sources, I'll be relying primarily on Anthony Beaver's The Spanish Civil War, one of the best journal histories of the conflict in English, as well as The Spanish Civil War 1936-39 by Francis Lannan. So now, if you're ready, let's take a look at the troubled Spanish Republic in 1936, still reeling from the aftermath of the attempted 1934 revolution in the northern mining districts and its subsequent violent suppression. In October 1934, an uprising of the organized miners in the northern province of Asturias occurred, growing out of an attempted nationwide general strike by a coalition of left-wing parties. Though the miners were put on, the campaign against them was nevertheless a death blow to the parliamentary government against which it had been carried out. Since its very recent inauguration in 1931, the Spanish Republic had pursued a modernizing and reformist program that was extraordinarily progressive by the standards of contemporary Spanish politics. In the years of the corrupt constitutional monarchy and the military dictatorship that had preceded the Republic, political possibilities were restricted to a very conservative program. As modernizing reforms were instituted by the new Republic, a honeymoon period ensued in which liberal capitalist Republicans and leftist social revolutionaries joined forces to pursue goals each had in common, namely those of clearing away archaic forms and practices and restricting or eliminating the political influence of reactionary bodies, such as the church and army. However, as the attempt to implement positive policies of land reform or industrial reorganization were pursued, the difference in outlook and aspirations between the liberal Republican and leftist elements in the coalition began to become troublesome. Many on the left were disappointed in the lack of progress in reforms, especially of land reform, and were frustrated by what they saw as bourgeois pettifogging on the part of their allies. The faith of the Spanish left in the system of representative government, a rare thing in Spanish history, was not very profound. In the view of many of them, the parliamentary form of government was inherently biased towards the property-owning classes and could never satisfy the aspirations of the oppressed classes. Worse still, it was obviously liable to manipulation by demagogues and by the power of moneyed interests. This basic lack of faith in the republican form of government was not limited to the left. The hard right was composed of fascists, ultra-conservative, quasi-medieval monarchists, and aristocratic landowners. In the eyes of many of these men, even a moderate republic was little different than outright Bolshevism. But the lack of confidence went much further than that. The euphoria which had attended the inauguration of the Republic was less an expression of enthusiasm for representative government itself than of the upending of the pre-existing system, which had ignored the needs and aspirations of the vast majority of the people. The decrees of the early days of the Republic did away with many of the worst aspects of Spanish political life, and these long overdue measures met with widespread support. But as the government grappled with the much harder problems of land reform and industrial relations, the results were disappointingly small and slow. The general lack of enthusiasm for republic per se can be seen by the impatience which with groups on the left sought avenues of reform outside the political process. This was in evidence most spectacularly in the 1934 general strike that turned into the Miners' Rebellion, which was undertaken after the rightist parliamentary opposition gained a dominant share of power. The 1933 electoral victory of this right-wing opposition party was the event which caused the more militant parts of the left to lose faith with the republic the harsh government repression of the miners, which resulted in perhaps 2,000 killed by the army and tens of thousands more given harsh prison sentences, alienated many others. As we mentioned, the general strike attempt had been a reaction to the entry into government of the representatives of the major right-wing party. The rise of this party, the CEDA, C-E-D-A, or Confederation Española de Derechas Autonomas, or Spanish Confederation of Autonomous Rightists, brought together the political forces of conservative Spain and was the parliamentary face of the reactionary coalition of church, landowner, and monarchist. A combination of political parties representing these interests brought together at the end of 1932, this party rapidly became the dominant political force on the right. Its leader and chief spokesman was José María Gilrobles, a prominent Catholic politician who, among other things, did not shrink from the use of fascist language. 
Though Spanish fascism itself was an insignificant political force during the time of the Republic, CETA representatives often spoke admiringly of Mussolini's regime in Italy and expressed their views on society in quasi-fascist terms of a romanticized past and of a regeneration of the national spirit in pursuit of a national destiny. This was powerfully attractive to Spanish conservatives who viewed the changing situation in Spain as a process of dissolution and degeneration, a triumph of chaos over order. Many on the left, therefore, saw the possibility of a seat of victory as the thin end of the fascist wedge and had little faith in the ability of the Republic to resist it. As for the Spanish fascists themselves, or the phalange, they had remained a fringe element in the nation's political scene until the last years of the Republic. Like many movements of this kind, it was the result of a fusion of smaller movements with varying programs. Its leader, José Antonio Primo de Rivera, the aristocratic son of the former dictator, was a compelling orator and an engaging personality whose rhetoric and charismatic leadership managed to weld together a movement consisting of young, rich, educated elitists and the dispossessed and resentful elements of the urban and rural poor. This was the classic fascist combination, united as always by fantasies of national regeneration as well as the glorification of the supposed cleansing or redemptive power of violence. Unique to the Spanish form of fascism was a glamorizing of militant Catholicism, and their programs were also presented using the imagery of the Crusades. Like other fascists, the Phalanges had only contempt for parliamentary government and usually eschewed any form of politics, preferring street violence and gun battles against those who, in their eyes, were the enemies of the true spirit of Spain. The Phalange would attract an increasing amount of money and support from the Spanish right as violence began to play a larger and larger part in the political situation, acting as their hired muscle. The last part of the Spanish rightist coalition consisted of Spaniards who wished for a return to a monarchical government. The Spanish monarchists came in two varieties. There were the Alfonsists, who wished for a return of the recently abdicated Alfonso XIII, or his designated successor. Though rich and well-connected, this party was too small to be of any moment on its own. The most important Spanish monarchists were the Carlists. These were an ultra-conservative party professing an extreme, nearly medieval form of theocratic Catholicism. Their name was a reference to their partisanship for Don Carlos, the brother of King Ferdinand VII. When this monarch died in the 1830s, the succession of the crown went to his daughter, Isabella II. The ultra-Orthodox could not countenance the succession of a woman and took up the cause of Don Carlos against the crown. The 19th century would see the Carlists fight three bloody wars against the crown, the last ending only in 1876. Subdued but not defeated, the hardcore of the Carlists still held out in their historical stronghold, Navarre, and had adherents all throughout the mountains of the staunchly Catholic Northeast. Although these monarchist groups usually eschewed electoral politics, they had money and the Carlists maintained a well-trained militia. These Carlist militiamen numbered in the thousands. They were known as requets, or recutes, and they trained as mounted riflemen and wore burgundy berets in the emblem of the Sacred Heart. They were very tough and skilled fighters and would form one of the most formidable elements of the army-led coalition in the coming conflict. When in the November 1933 elections, the CETA won the largest share of seats in the Spanish Parliament and the right to a commensurate number of ministry positions, the fears expressed on the left about the robustness of the Republic against fascism seemed confirmed and many Spaniards sought a remedy outside the political process. Their action took the form of the above-mentioned October 1934 general strike, and this failed to materialize in any strength except in the northern province of Asturias, where strong organizations of socialist and anarchist miners drove out the government forces. So formidable did this revolt become that the government called in veteran units of the African army to put down the revolt and restore order there. The forces called upon were the hardened colonial units of the Spanish Legion and the Regularis, commanded by Generals Manuel Godet and Francisco Franco, two leaders who would figure prominently in the events of two years later. The forces they led were veterans of the recent fighting against the Rif rebels in Morocco, and had distinguished themselves there both in aggression, toughness, and a ruthlessness towards opponents that gave them a terrible reputation for brutality. This reputation was renewed in the bitter fighting among the mountains of the Asturias, and little quarter was given to the rebellious miners, who were defeated after a savage campaign lasting about two weeks. As for the actions of the CETA once in government, the leftist suspicions proved true, though their efforts were somewhat less effective than had been feared. The conservatives did indeed move to roll back much of the progress that had been made in the foregoing three years. This included efforts to dismantle the protections being set up for industrial workers and the dialing back of some of Azania's anti-clerical measures. Most importantly, in terms of the coming civil war, 
Attempts were made to further limit attempts to deal with the most pressing social problem, the distribution of land to the landless in the southern provinces of the country. Much of the land that had ended up subject to redistribution had been either church lands or the lands of large landowners, alienated by the modernizing reforms of the past century, and many on the right wanted them returned to what they considered to be their rightful owners. The already slow and underfunded process was reduced to almost nothing under CETA administration. In response, the Spanish peasants lost faith in the Republic's program to redistribute land in their favor and saw no alternative to continued hopeless poverty under its rule. The two years of right-wing government became known among the Spanish left as the Biennio Negro or the Two Black Years. Much of the left's early support had been eroded, and to many it seemed that representative government had not meant that the social change they wanted to see was imminent. Yet the left was not ready to abandon the republic altogether, and as the 1936 elections approached embarked on a popular front strategy. This was a communist initiative, in conformance with the policy of Moscow at the time. During this period, many European communist parties were controlled to some extent by the Soviet Union through the instrument of the Communist International. Originally an international conference of revolutionary organizations, in the age of Stalin it had become, like most other forms of communist organization, an instrument of Russian policy. In the mid-1930s, this policy was oriented against the rising threat of fascism, and the popular front strategy was meant to combat the rise of fascist parties in the parliaments of Europe. Basically, this consisted of a policy of forming all the left-to-center groups into a united front, which would act in concert in electoral and legislative action. This policy was pursued in France, where it bore fruit in the Leon Blum government, a coalition of just this type, which came to power in May. The popular front strategy, when it worked, overcame the chief political weakness of leftists, disunity. Where different right-wing groups can be brought together with comparative ease into alliance under a strong authority, leftist groups tend to fight amongst themselves and fritter away much of their energy and resources in controversies and squabbles. The Spanish popular front brought together the left republicans, socialists, communists, and even the anarchists. These last, who usually totally opposed participation in the parliamentary process, were brought into the fold by the promise that their comrades imprisoned for their participation in the 1934 uprising would be released. This promise shows the advantage of unity in action, as it was the votes of the many members of the large Spanish anarchist organizations that brought the Popular Front their victory in the elections of February 1936. Ironically, it was very likely the Popular Front victory which broke the power of the Republic. The government's ability to keep public order had been eroding since 1934, and the amount and intensity of political violence was rapidly escalating as the 1936 elections approached. The victory of the left-wing coalition was taken by many as an endorsement of the social revolution itself. More and more often, the people on both sides, through their organizations, were ignoring the government and taking matters into their own hands. This manifested itself in street violence and lawlessness in the cities, as gangs of armed men representing leftist militias and so-called fascist shock troops fought amongst themselves. The most important reaction to the Popular Front victory, however, was again related to the stalling out of the land reform program and the frustration of the poverty-stricken peasantry. Not long after the victory of the left, these men and women began to settle the matter at their own initiative by simply occupying the empty land and settling there. The forces of the government, increasingly unable to deal with the rising tide of violence throughout the country, took no strong measures against this move by the common people. To the Spaniards on the right, the acquiescence of the government to these land occupations was an indication that the government would no longer protect property. It was the first of two events that triggered their final defection from the Republic and their consequent support of those who plotted to overthrow it. The second trigger, and the more immediate, was a political assassination. These were not uncommon in Spain at the time, but the victim this time was José Calvo Sotelo, a prominent monarchist politician and one of the chief conservative parliamentarians. José Castillo, a left-wing assault guard, or policeman, was gunned down in Madrid by fascist thugs on the night of July 12th. In retaliation, other assault guards drove to Calvo Sotillo's residence on the next night and placed him under arrest. He was taken into a car and shot, and his body delivered to the city morgue. This was the final straw for many on the right, who now saw the Republic was not only unable to protect property, but even the lives of prominent men from violence, but was actually the perpetrator of that violence. As a body that began turning away from the Republic, which in their eyes was now little more than an instrument of Bolshevik terror, and towards the men who were prepared to do away with it. During this time, the army was not uninterested in the growing political chaos in the country. Since the fight against Napoleon in the early 1800s, the army had assumed an important role in the Spanish political scene. 
This was a result of the widespread loss of confidence in the ruling dynasty that occurred as a result of the intervention of the French and the prestige gained by the army in the struggle against the occupying French forces that followed. Throughout much of the 19th century, the military had intervened decisively in Spanish politics, carrying out many modernizing reforms that the other powers that be had proven unwilling or unable to perform. This was usually done in the form of a pronunciamento, which was a swift coup in which the soldiers seized power, imposed their political will, and then withdrew to relieve the new system to function. Thus, while the army gained greatly in political influence and power during the 1800s, periods of military rule were actually rare. Thus, the image of the army as the savior of the country could be cultivated, while at the same time the opprobrium for the failures of the system most easily fell on the civilian politicians. Following the end of the Carlist Wars and the establishment of the restored monarchy in the 1870s, however, the army increasingly became identified with the failures of the ruling conservative coalition, which they supported and maintained. The repeated military humiliations suffered by Spain throughout the 1800s, which included the loss of virtually the whole of the overseas empire, coincided with the growing domestic political role of the army, until the ethos of the service began to give a predominant place to the army's perception of itself as the ultimate guardian of the Spanish historical patrimony. With this came a feeling of opposition to the larger society and the legal rulers that grew among large sections of the more active and motivated members of the officer corps. This attitude became greatly heightened as a result of the chain of disasters experienced by Spanish troops in their campaigns against the rebellious elements of the population in the tiny bit of Moroccan territory that was left to Spain. The growing feeling of alienation from the larger society was joined to a feeling of betrayal and bitterness stemming from the army's failures in Morocco, which many among the officer corps were only too willing to blame on the government and, to an extent, the civilian population itself. They felt that Spain's people and rulers had refused them support and hamstrung their operations with carping criticisms and with reluctance to serve as draftees. These men, in the manner of any fascist thinkers, thus viewed their patriotism as a thing that set them against their actual people of their country. Their loyalty was not to the country they actually served, but to their own conception of the true Spain, and ultimately, then, to their own self-image as its true protectors. These officers, the so-called Africanistas, were the cream of the military professionals in the Spanish army. They were in leadership positions as the breakdown of the Republic progressed, plots began to form. In 1933, conservative officers formed a professional association, the UME, or Union Militar Española, Spanish Military Union, and this attracted many of the more competent and senior Spanish officers to its ranks. The members of this group were among the most able and influential men in the service, and they saw in the action, and more particularly in the rhetoric, of the liberalizing Azania government, the thin edge of the Bolshevist wedge. Another often voiced concern was the granting of limited self-government to the Catalans and the Basques, which they saw as a direct threat to the territorial integrity of the state, the maintenance of which they had come to view as their responsibility, whatever the government of the day may decide. Under the auspices of the UME, conspiratorial preparations began to take place. The failure of the 1932 attempted coup by San Yorio, which attracted almost no support and was easily suppressed, deterred action for the next couple of years, but the beginning of a new scale of political disturbances following the 1934 revolutionary attempt renewed the officers' determination to build support for a coup, and they began to make connections with the more conservative groups of the country, seeking money and political backing. Approaches were made to the CETA leader Gil Robles and the chief leader of the Carlists, Falconde, among others. These leaders expressed sympathy and possible support, but were unwilling to commit to action. The army was by no means a monolithic block behind the conspirators, however. While the veteran troops of the African territories were solidly behind their leaders, who were in general the leading lights of the conspiracy, the mass of the troops in Spain itself were short-service conscripts with little stake in the rising, and only apathy towards the service in general. Among the officers, as well, there were many men loyal to the Republic and many of leftist sympathies. These had their own rival association, the UMRA, or Republican Anti-Fascist Military Union, but this was much smaller than the UME and consisted of more junior officers. The security of the largely corrupt and inefficient Spanish army in the peninsula was porous enough that the activities of the plotters were not a very well-kept secret. In response, the responsible officials of the Popular Front Government's Ministry of War decided to post some of the more active and ambitious commanders to distant commands where they would hopefully be too far from the centers of power to easily stage a revolt. While this would seem to be a good idea in theory, in reality the effect was to establish many of the most dangerous conspirators in positions where they could act virtually unsupervised by the central government. Generals Manuel Godet and Francisco Franco, notorious among the left as the leaders of the bloody suppression of the Asturias Miners' Rebellion, 
were posted to commands in the Balearic and Canary Island groups, respectively. Here, they were virtually independent of the central government and able to appoint trustworthy subordinates and establish immediate bases from which they could act in the event of an uprising, complete with a balanced but small contingent of troops under their command. Similar situations obtained in the critical African territory, where solidly anti-Republican Africanista commanders were able to run the territory as an almost independent military reservation. Most important for the progress of the conspiracy, however, was the appointment of General Emilio Mola to the command of the garrison in Pamplona. Here, in the conservative, heavy Catholic Northeast, this officer, who was the leading spirit and coordinator of the plotting, was able to establish easy and secure contacts with their principal allies on the hard right. Aside from the moneyed landowning interests in the church, whose support could be taken for granted, the base of Pamplona was convenient for maintaining contact with the Phalange and especially the Carlists, who were strongly represented in this area. Approaches by the conspirators, usually through the person of Mola, were made to all elements of the rightist forces in the country, and support was indicated, but doctrinal difficulties involving the post-revolt government to be established kept the fascists and the monarchists from committing to the project till the above-mentioned land occupations, which united many conservatives in terror of the widespread appropriation of property by the rural masses. This commitment to support of a revolt, however, still remained tentative until the assassination of Calvo Sotillo on the 13th, which removed the last objections to immediate action. Events were to move quickly after this date. The revolt was timed to begin first in the Moroccan provinces, where opposition was likely to be all but non-existent. The next day, the garrisons of the mainland were scheduled to declare for the rebellion, and if necessary, to march on Madrid. It seems evident that the generals, though they feared opposition, did not anticipate a long struggle. Likely, with recent Spanish history in mind, they thought in terms of a quick coup which would leave them free to suppress what they called Bolshevist disorders in the country, and re-establish conservative government in one or another form. This, they thought, was likely to succeed or fail immediately. The Moroccan phase of the insurrection, launched just four days after Calvo Sotillo's murder, took place on the 17th. Little resistance was encountered, and the colonial territories were soon behind the revolt. The revolts on the mainland were a different story. Some of the local commanders jumped the gun and declared early, while others hesitated. By the evening of the 18th, hundreds if not thousands of local battles were being fought throughout Spain, as local garrisons rose and attempted to take control of public services. In some regions, such as the conservative areas of Navarre, Leon, and Old Castile, public sympathy was generally with the rebellion. This resulted in large areas of northern Spain falling easily to the rebels. In the south, the area around Seville was secured for the rebellion by the remarkable actions of the general Capodolano, who through a combination of bluff, threats, and charisma rallied the garrison of the city to the general's cause. In these places, civilian government disappeared and was replaced by direct military rule, often administered by their allies among the phalange. This fascist organization swelled enormously in numbers after the military takeover, thousands and thousands joining in the days following the coup. No doubt many of these were Spaniards with genuine fascist sympathies. Many of these new recruits were pre-war radical leftists, who along with other politically suspect people, joined the fascist bands as a mean of personal protection. Many of these men would desert the phalange at the first safe opportunity. In most of the rest of the country, however, unexpectedly effective and determined resistance was encountered, and many of the revolting garrisons were either put down or shut up in fortresses and barracks and besieged. In many cases, opposition came from loyal members of the army itself, or from the paramilitary police troops who happened to be on hand. The most important force in the resistance to this takeover, however, were the organized working class organizations and the militias that these trade unions maintained. This resistance proved highly effective, and along with the loyal elements of the army and the paramilitary police, the forces which would now come to be known to history as the Republicans put down the revolt in nearly all of the important cities of Spain, including the industrial centers of Bilbao and Barcelona, as well as in the capital. In addition, the entire Mediterranean coast and most of the south was won for the Republic. In most of this area, especially in the countryside, the rule of the parliamentary government was in practice ignored, and social revolutionary doctrines of whatever group held power were implemented. The forces opposing the rebelling officers and their right-wing allies were the same as those represented by the Popular Front. This embraced all political groups to the left of the now very small center. This ranged from the left Republicans, such as Azania, to the extreme left wing composed of communists and anarchists. These latter now became by far the most important element of these forces. Thousands of men rallied to the cause of the leftist militias, many out of conviction, but some out of a desire to hide a politically suspect past and protect themselves and their families from retribution. 
Another reason was protection from the chaos which intended the collapse of the civil order, as people of all kinds took advantage of the opportunity to eliminate personal enemies, rivals, and creditors. A phenomenon very similar to the disappearance of the pre-war government and army-controlled zone occurred in the supposedly loyal territories as well. Although throughout most of its territory the republic still did exist, it and its politicians simply became irrelevant. These and the parties they controlled would still prove useful, in particular as a means of retaining international legitimacy and securing outside assistance. However, this would only become important later on, as the front lines stabilized and the initial chaotic phase of the fighting settled down. For now, the Second Republic was swept away by the social revolution that began upon the breakdown of the public order occasioned by the rebellion. The revolution was the work of the left-wing trade unions and political parties, most of whom retained armed elements. These now seized weapons and led the fight against the army and their allies. The socialists, anarchists, and communist groups in the Republican territories all fielded militia forces. As the mainland garrisons rose, these groups often led the fight against them, siding with whatever soldiers and paramilitaries may have opposed the rebels as well. In the first months of the Civil War, it was these forces of basically untrained, ill-equipped, but highly motivated civilians that held the line against the army and their allies. The most important of these working class militias were the socialists, anarchists, and communists. The latter two fielded the largest and most effective forces, but these differed very much in character. The anarchists, the most important of the militias in the initial weeks of the fighting, were represented by the CNT, a primarily urban industrial trade union, and the FIA, an association of rural libertarian groups. These frequently manifested an attachment to doctrinal purity that made the fighters object to leaders and orders, leading to predictable difficulties and operations of all kinds. Nevertheless, it was the anarchists who decisively defeated the rebellion in Barcelona and subsequently led the offensive against the army and the Carlists in Aragon. The communists came in two varieties. Moscow-supported Orthodox group, the PSUC, and a smaller, more libertarian party known as the POUM. The former of these stood out among the militia formations for their superior organization and discipline, and this was to characterize communist units throughout the struggle. The POUM militia, in whom the writer George Orwell was to serve, was closer to the anarchists in doctrine. Cooperation among the leftist groups was difficult, and throughout the war, forces grouped together under the Republican label would be hamstrung by persistent infighting and mutual suspicion, which more than once broke out into actual armed combat. The communists would become much more important in the later portion of the war, and would come to predominate in the Republican government, in no small part due to the substantial assistance given by the Soviet Union. The final part of the Republican coalition was somewhat anomalous. These were the regional separatists in the provinces of Catalonia and Vizcaya, the latter often referred to as the Basque Country. In both of these regions, many felt themselves to be ethnically distinct from the rest of the peninsular, or Castilian, Spain. These claims were based upon historical, linguistic, and cultural grounds, and the demands they made for regional autonomy were rooted in economic and political realities. Historically, these regions did not share so much in the Spanish national myth based around the reconquest of the peninsula from the Muslims and the discovery of the New World Empire, which were the achievements primarily of the Kingdom of Castile. Vizcaya and Catalonia had then been oriented towards France and the Mediterranean, and taken only a small part in the Castilian Crusade. Economically, these were the most modern regions of Spain, and her industrial and commercial centers. They were also the only areas with a significant middle class. The regionalist movements were in fact middle class movements, and were supported by the capitalists among the Catalan and Basque elites. In addition, the Basque nationalist government had close historical association to the Carlists, and had a distinctively conservative character which emphasized devotion to the church. They were therefore strange allies for the very radical anarchists and other left-wing elements in the emerging opposition to the army. However, despite this more conservative outlook, the regionalists were unable to accept military rules that would mean the loss of their regional governments and the autonomy from the central Spanish government that it represented. As a result, the Basque provinces in the northeast, center of Spanish heavy industry and arms production, which would otherwise have been in sympathy with the revolt, was saved for the Republic, along with the adjacent coastal provinces of Santander and Asturias, where the left-wing organizations subdued in 1934 asserted themselves again in the revolt and shut up the garrison in its barracks at Oviedo, the Basque territories would form an enclave of Republican territory in the north, splitting the army's forces. The bulk of the north, however, was quickly organized under Mola's leadership. The army and the right-wing militias began to form columns in March, some against the Basques, and some on Madrid. The troops heading for Madrid ran into heavy resistance in the mountains to the north of the city, 
while those sent to the Basques were similarly halted by a combination of anarchist and Basque troops. Worse, the anarchist militias, having routed the army out of Barcelona, were pressing the offensive into Aragon and moving against Zaragoza. While this was going on, the army began to build up its strength in the south. Capo Delano, having secured Seville, moved with the forces he had in hand at the beginning of the revolt and gathered their allies among the now rapidly expanding phalangists. These men secured the area around about Seville and pressed eastwards and southwards towards Cadiz and Cordoba. Cadiz, once the seat of radical liberalism during the fight against Napoleon's lieutenants, fell to the rebels, bringing the naval base there under the general's control. Cordoba held out for somewhat longer, and all throughout Andalusia and the south, bitter struggles were fought between right and left in each town and village. Soon, an enclave of army-controlled territory in the south had been brought under control. An air bridge was established between Morocco and Seville, and the hardcore battalions of the Regulares and the Legion were built up with the assistance of German and Italian transport aircraft sent to Franco's aid by the fascist powers. These planes, a few dozen Savoia Marchetti and Junkers 52 tri-motor transports, were the initial representatives of fascist aid to the rebels, and they began arriving within 10 days of the revolt. The operation these planes carried out, along with a handful of Spanish types, was the first military airlift of any size in history. These planes began shuttling the veteran troops of the Legion and the Regulares, who between them made up the fighting corps of the Spanish army, and were instrumental in the success of the revolt at this stage. Over the next three months, the fascist supplied planes would carry nearly 14,000 battle-hardened soldiers to the mainland, plus much valuable equipment. The usefulness did not end there, as some of these planes would be hastily modified to carry bombs and mounted raids against the loyal Spanish naval forces attempting to blockade the army in Morocco. Their intervention in this capacity was crucial to the success of the so-called Victory Convoy, which ran the blockade on August 5th and delivered perhaps 3,000 soldiers and much of their heavy equipment to Cadiz. The build-up of this force enabled Francisco Franco, who had left his garrison in the Canaries and flown by chartered British plane to take command of the African forces in Morocco, to begin his drive north to meet up with Mola's troops and drive on Madrid. This airlift, and the assistance from the dictators that it represented, probably saved the revolt from collapse. The case of the Navy was an indication of the lack of preparation for a long fight on the part of the plotters. The officer corps of the Spanish fleet was in sympathy with the rebellion, but the plotters had overlooked the organization that had been going on among the sailors. Here, left-wing sympathies were much more commonplace than in the army, and when the time came to raise the flag of revolt, the sailors, in the mass, refused to follow the lead of their officers. The crews rose against the officers and locked them up or shot them, and began to run the Spanish Navy by means of revolutionary sailors' committees on the Soviet model. This could have been decisive. The hardcore of the army's strength, the Legion and the Regulares, would have been stranded in Morocco, unable to come to the aid of the generals without transport across the straits. The assets in the hands of the rebels amounted to a few gunboats and a small number of small transport aircraft, and without this foreign assistance, these would have been too few to bring enough of the African troops over to the mainland in time to prevent the rapidly mobilizing working class organizations from quelling the revolt and then, most likely, carrying out their idea of social revolution. Other examples of the expectation of a quick victory or defeat by the generals can be cited, perhaps chief among them the case of the shortage of ammunition in the hands of Mola's troops in the north. The Spanish army's ammunition supply was plagued by the effects of corruption, neglect, and poverty common among the peninsular units. This specifically resulted in the use of recycled ammunition, the cartridges of which were often refilled over and over again, and which were of widely varying quality, many of which being simply useless. When faced with the need to use these rounds, the Spanish soldiers used them up very quickly. Cut off as he was from African territory, where generally superior munitions were concentrated, Mola's rebels found themselves with very short supplies of useful ammunition. This was only remedied, like the naval blockade, by outside intervention, in the form of aid sent by ship from Germany, or flown in from the southern army-controlled zones in foreign supply transport aircraft. So this was the situation in the immediate aftermath of the revolt, and it slowly began to crystallize from a myriad of unrelated battles into a clearer situation. The army, along with its right-wing allies, who were already acting as its subordinates, held most of the north of the country in a substantial enclave in the south. With the help of the first bits of outside aid from the fascist countries, they were preparing for what they hoped would be their decisive drive on the capital. Their opponents, welded into an unwieldy coalition by their common action against the rebellion, held the bulk of the country, including the great cities and the industrial regions. Both sides began a process of reorganization once some stability had been achieved and settled in for a long fight. And that's where I'm going to conclude this episode. I hope you found some of what I had to say interesting or useful. I hope that I was able to convey something of the character of the transition from order to chaos that took place over the short 
tragic lifespan of the Second Spanish Republic. The chief cause of this breakdown, which I wish to make clear, was the general loss of faith in the institution of government to control the centrifugal tendencies in the very divided society of early 20th century Spain. Next time we talk about Spain, I'm going to expand on the little bit that I mentioned here about the very important role of the Spanish Navy in the initial stage of the Civil War. Though the Spanish Civil War was primarily a land and air struggle, the part of the Spanish Navy and the navies of foreign powers that made this struggle their business has a great deal of interest in its own right. Next time, however, we'll continue our survey of the activities of the American armed forces in the decades before the Second World War. This will take the form of an examination of a lesser known operation, the Siberian Expedition of 1918. Here, American soldiers would fight the troops of the brand new Red Army under the command of Japanese officers. I hope you'll join me for that. And until then, this is Mark Seven, once again wishing you all the best.